Vayam Deme Havun. Welcome, we are connected, or greetings in my constructed language, Parakehiteki. My name is Marat Wedeman, and I am sharing with you my constructed language today. To start us off, constructed languages are artificially made languages that have been consciously produced as opposed to languages that evolve naturally over time. Now, there can be a few reasons for creating a constructed language, one being political aims, such as creating a lingua franca, an internationally used language between countries that don't share one, or they can be made for more creative purposes, like in media, some very famous examples of those being Klingon from the movie Star Trek or Navi from the movie Avatar. And today I'm going to be sharing with you the components, the structures of my conlang that I've been developing over the past year. Now, the first thing that I thought about was who speaks my language? This is important because language and culture are deeply intertwined. They affect how we use language, what we get meaning from. And so I needed to know what kind of culture is using the language. So I decided that they would live on the moon. I wanted it to feel alien-like, foreign, but something that we're familiar with. I wanted there to be a familiarity for English speakers or anybody who's from Earth. The moon has a very deep sense of familiarity. So there is some sort of way we can conceptualize people living on the moon, but it does feel foreign and exotic at the same time. These people are also matrilineal and matrilocal. Matrilineal being they trace lineage through the maternal side and matrilocal being that they live with the maternal side of the family and they also are a farming society. Now the Structures of the language that I'm going to talk about are phonetics, morphology, syntax, and semantics. Phonetics being the sounds of the language, morphology being um, the smallest meaningful unit of language and how that is conveyed in my language. Syntax, the structure of sentences, and semantics deals with meaning. So phonetics is how we're gonna start this off. This is the consonant inventory of Parakehiseki. Now, most of these consonant sounds are very familiar to English speakers and all of these sounds are possible and seen in natural languages. Now, as an English speaker, I picked some sounds that were pretty unfamiliar and foreign sounding to me, but that does not mean that every uh, language would feel foreign to this one. Just as a English speaker or a lot of Western languages, European languages would have that feeling this, some of the sounds like the bilabial trill, which sounds like are found in Africa. And that's where I drew inspiration from that. There's also the lateral fricative, the sh, which is found in some Native American languages. So I use these sounds in a combination to give a foreign feeling, but that is a pretty Anglo-Saxon view, just to be clear. But there are also some things where I've done, I've left out and included voicing 
differences. So I have the v sound, which does appear in English, but it is also paired with the voiceless. But the voiced is the only one present in my language. And we have in English s and z, which are the voiced and voiceless pair, but I only have the voiceless. There are a couple more that are not present in English that I included, but all of those choices were to create something that I felt was a little bit different and the combinations would be interesting. This is the vowel inventory. I have a pretty large vowel inventory with nine vowel sounds. And I wanted to have pretty high contrasting vowel sounds. So I left out central vowels. So there's only front and back vowels, which is about the placement of the tongue in your mouth when making those sounds. And I added a vowel that we don't use in English specifically, which is the high mid front vowel. It's a rounded front vowel, which is not in English. And um, these in combination with the consonants are what I use to make words. Moving on to morphology. We have several things that are in this category that I have created, case number, tense, and reduplication. Case is a system of marking dependent nouns for the type of relationship they bear to their heads, according to Blake, 1997. This being said, in Padakehiteki, I use prefixes to mark that relationship. Number is another thing in this section. Number is how many, so plural, singular, things like that. Tense, when it took place, and reduplication is the repetition of a whole word or parts of a word to give more information, grammatical or semantic. Starting out with case, I have a few case markings that are in Parakehiteki. They are all prefixes. And the nominative case marks the subject in the sentence, and it is marked with the prefix O, O, and so in an example, it sounds like O nido. So that is the subject of the sentence, um, marking the noun boy as the subject. The locative case, so where something occurs, is marked by the prefix da. So da gone at the tree. The temporal when something happened is marked by ina, ina joga at 10. The accusative case marks the direct object of a sentence and that is marked with the prefix e. So e machilo, a peach as the direct object. Now the evidential case markings are not on nouns, they're on um, verbs and evidential case marks how you know where you got your evidence from. And I have three evidential cases. There are more that can be seen in languages. Uh, this inferential case can be seen in some Native American languages. Um, so I have the inferential evidential case marked by the prefix in. So in this sentence, Oden 
Chima in Jake. The in between Jima and Jake is where you see the inferential evidential, and it's he must have eaten. So there is some circumstantial evidence that is leading you to believe that that occurred. Hearsay evidential marks Kate uh, marks for things you know from hearing it from another party. So they told you that is marked by Len. So in this sentence, Oden Chima Len Jake. So the same sentence. Um, he ate, they say. So somebody told you, and that's how you got that information. And finally, Direct evidential case, it's marking for evidence you directly have evidence of. Usually it's visual, visual evidence you saw it with your own eyes. So that is marked by the prefix vo. So in the same sentence, oden chimo vo jake. So he ate, ate, and it's kind of implied that you probably saw him ate, eat. Next is number. Number is also marked by prefixes. So in Pareke Hiteki, there is the singular, the dual, and the plural. So in English, we do not have a specific dual marking. Um, dual is just that there is two, specifically two. So one, two, or more than two. So the singular is marked by the prefix kane. So kane o nido, singular boy. The dual is nage, nage o nido, two boys. And as you can see, the subject marker is still there. And the plural, pare, pare o nido, more than two boys. Next is tense, which is also marked by a prefix. And in Padeke Hiteki, present and future are not differentiated and past is differentiated. So example, chi loma is smell. So either smell, you're smelling now or in the future. So, and chima marks past. So chima loma, to have you smelled. Reduplication is also in Padeke Hiteki. Uh, I have two types of reduplication. Partial reduplication, which I actually, the placement, having the middle consonant and vowel reduplicate was uh, inspired by Choctaw, the Native American language. So I used partial reduplication in the middle to um, differentiate between temporary and permanent aspects. So mi xing is to be cold and mi xi xing is to be cold natured. So the reduplication marks the permanent aspect. And an Indonesian language is how I drew inspiration for the partial and full reduplication. That is the next example, which it's marking the degree of intensity. So, fula means happy. And if you do a partial reduplication, fu fula, it's somewhat happy. And if you do a full reduplication, fula, fula, it's very happy. So the degree of reduplication corresponds with the degree of intensity. And this reduplication is a prefix, while the partial reduplication above is in the middle. Next is syntax or sentence structure. And first I'm gonna talk about pronouns in 
Pare ke hideki. This pronoun system is pretty similar to English's pronoun system. There are just a couple differences. One being third person. In third person, there is a distinction between animate and inanimate. So it is there for the inanimate, but there's no distinction of gender between the animate. So he and she are both then, they're both Ren, but uh, it is Muggy. That differentiation is there. There's also uh, two first person plural forms, the inclusive and the exclusive. This refers to when you say we in the inclusive, it includes the speaker, the addressee, and potentially others. The we exclusive includes the speaker and others and not the addressee. In Pareke Hiteki, there is a subject object verb word order and nominative accusative alignment. This meaning that transitive verbs and intransitive verbs, the subject of those is not marked differently than, uh, but the object is marked differently. So in this sentence, opam kane e babo chima pe, my dog ran, the subject is not marked different, but different than this sentence, kane o nido, kane gone, which does have an object, the boy sees the tree. Uh, these other two are just two more example sentences to show the morphology in a sentence. It also gives a sense of the order of the prefix prefixes for the cases. So you can see that the uh, number comes before the case. And that is the word order. We also have question formation. Polar questions are questions that can be answered with a yes or a no. And it is marked with a particle. Now, a lot of, there are several languages that do use particles to mark questions, but I drew inspiration from Japanese on this one, knowing that they have a question particle for WH questions. So who, what, when, where, why, how, it's a little bit different. The um, question, there are question words and the part, question particle is still included in there to still mark that it is a question. So as you can see, there's an example with what is the boy eating? Bame kane o nido chijake mia that what is the boy eating the wh question is at the front now for the last section semantics so in my sem semantic section i'm just going to be talking about kinship terms since um Padeke Hiteki is a matrilineal society i looked at other matrilineal societies that exist to see how their kinship systems work. So this is the crow kinship system, which I based mine off of. Now crow is a Native American group. And as you can see, the males are triangles and the females are circles. And what's important about the crow kinship system is that the matrilineal line has more distinction in it than the patrilineal side. Um, so as you can see, A is used for the father, the father's brother, and the father's sister's son. And the word for the father's sister is also used for the father's sister's daughter. But there is distinction. The mother's 
brother has a separate word and his children have separate words. So I used this as inspiration for my own kinship system. So here are my kinship terms. As you can see, there is not a distinctive word for father's brother or the father's siblings' children going along with the crow system. And these words are used to describe blood relation and marriage relation. And the distinction between generational differences is also only marked on the maternal side as well. So that's another thing like why the father, sister's son is not a different word than the father or the father's brother. There is not that generational distinction on that side. Thank you, health and happiness or goodbye. Um, thank you for listening to my presentation and goodbye. It's just a minute over.